So hello, after a few weeks away, we're back here on Love Rugby League and Love Rugby League TV. Uh, we're going to be looking at the World Cup just gone. Uh, a fascinating tournament. I'm Dave Parkinson, as always, joined by the gaffer, the boss, the man in the know. That's James Gordon, by the way. Thanks. Hello, Dave. Yeah, good to be back. We've had a few weeks off, haven't we? We have, yeah. Yeah, I tried this world of work. It didn't really work for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so... Uh, we've had the World Cup done and dusted. Uh, Australia winning it, justifiably so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it was what you expected, wasn't it? I think, um, you know, they barely con- what was it? They'd conceded uh, one try or something. Uh, what was it? Three tries, I think, in the lead up to the final. Um, you know, even in the two games England played them, they only conceded what the four points. Um, and, you know, they're just streets ahead of everyone else, aren't they? Um, Australia. And, yeah, it would have been a big upset if they would have to have lost it, um, just as it was, you know, nearly 10 years ago when they lost the 2008 final to New Zealand. Um, but, you know, it's up to everyone else to, to catch them. Obviously, it's the age-old question is what do, what does England or Great Britain have to do to, to compete with them? And, then it, it, you know, it's one of them things. Maybe it's just... It's just you know, not possible. Well, not not possible, but you know, they're the, they're the big. They're the, ultimately they're the biggest and best country, aren't they? What did you make of the game? Because I mean, really low scoring. In fact, it's the lowest scoring World Cup final in World Cup history. I thought it was really intense. I, I mean, I don't know about you, Dave, but I felt watching it. It felt like it went on for ages. Like it felt like a re- you know, like every ten minutes felt like half an hour. Mm. You know, not in a bad way. You know, in a in a in a really you know good intense. You know, can't take your eyes off it sort of way. Um, you tend to find, I think, more and more of the the bigger games are getting like that, aren't they? Where the the they, they sort of get into a little, you know, when there's when there's two teams going at a very low score, and obviously everyone plays the percentage plays and stuff. You know, for England, it was all about having to complete the sets to get the territory, and um, you know, and, and obviously they ground Australia down. I mean, I, I know obviously England. I mean, everyone's England seems to have come out of it with quite a lot of credit, don't they? Mm. In terms of how they how they played now they defended and you know you can't take that away from them but you know to not score any points is 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 a little frustrating um, I guess when you look at it though I mean England did have a couple of penalty attempts that they could have had which would have been near the post which would have got the scoreboard ticking do you kind of like look back on those or do you think it's just a state of the modern game that maybe people don't uh, go for goal kicks anymore I think to be honest, that I mean, it, there was one I remember in the first half, maybe maybe about thirty minutes or so, that was very, very kickable. That you know they were they were close to the line, and you know I suppose it's very easy when you're six 0 down to just write off the two points and think, you know, we need to try. You know, ultimately mm. we're going to have to score to get back into it. But I mean, if you watch, you know, I mean, I watch a bit of rugby union, and a lot of the teams will tactically kick themselves back into the game, you know, because. If you're six points down, you still got to score twice anyway. Mm-hmm. You've got to gamble. You know, even if England had scored a try at the end, they'd have still had to have kicked the goal to to tie it up, and then they would have had to score more points to get to get back on it. So, I mean, it's easy in hindsight, isn't it? To it's easy in hindsight to to say, oh, they should have took the penalties. But maybe you know, in future games, you know, maybe you shouldn't you shouldn't not you know you shouldn't knock off them. Um, Knock, knock away those points. Maybe you should just take them when they're on offer. They always say never look a gift horse in the mouth, don't they? And th- there were a couple of occasions where they could have knocked. Yeah, I'm two, sure. I'm sure. You know, and I'm, I'm sure. That, yeah, I'm sure there was enough. There was enough opportunities for them to get back into it. Uh, you know, and we do knock rugby union a little bit for the amount of kicking that goes on. But ultimately, I mean, I know the point system is slightly different in rugby union, which means kicks are more valuable. But but ultimately, it, it is a way of, like I say, coming away with some points on the board. Um, you know, and then going again. Um, but I mean, I mean, in some ways, it's good. I mean, obviously, it'd been great for England to have won, but it's it's nice that they've come away with, you know, with with a positive a positive feeling and a positive vibe, and hopefully that'll extend itself to next season's Test series against New Zealand, where where hopefully plenty of people will turn up and, you know, and watch. You know, I guess what England needs and and what rugby league needs is for sell out crowds at all the international games and. Um, hopefully now the games at, at Hull and Anfield and Ellen Road next year will will head that way. To be fair, it's good to have England in a final again because I couldn't believe it when they were saying in the build-up it had been 22 years. And yeah, it is so hard to believe that 1995 was the last time they were in a World Cup final. Well, I mean, I always say, you know, they've they've been coming third in a three-horse race. 
you know, because that's what it, that's ultimately what it has been. And you know, obviously, this World Cup has maybe shown that, you know, maybe there are people, you know, maybe there are teams ready to take over from New Zealand. Maybe as as you know, in that top three, is that is that a case of Tonga etc. have become stronger, or is it that New Zealand have just got weaker? And I think maybe it's the latter more so than anything else. I think it's probably helped that uh, several high profile players yeah, yeah, from Australia about, yeah. and New Zealand decided that they represent other countries you know, this time that, Yeah, I mean definitely. I mean yeah, sorry, I mean I shouldn't they have got stronger, don't get me wrong. Um but yeah, I always used to you know it's like Steve McNamara, you know. Yeah, okay. You know, people might say he did a good job, but ultimately at the last World Cup England came third in a three horse race. Mm. You know, this year you can say well they've come second. You can't really call it a three horse race because obviously it's not it's not quite being as as cut and dry as that this time. Um, so yeah, I mean, in in many ways, it, it, it it's progress. I mean, you can't really say that. You know, they had a tough semi final against Tonga. Okay, you know, you, they would have normally had to have beaten New Zealand in the semi final, but you know, ultimately Tonga beat New Zealand. So I'll tell you what, that was a cracking game, wasn't it? I, I was sat there with my cornflakes because of all these early morning kickoffs, as you can imagine. Yeah. Cup of tea on the side, tucking in, thinking this you is not fancy a KFC. Didn't they, did the adverts not make you fancy a KFC? Oh no, the, my brother's the KFC merchant. Oh right, okay. You know, with, with me, it's uh, no, it's a bit of a no no. It's too early for that type yeah, of greasy yeah, food. Yeah. Anyway, I know there was a, there was What do a... you what do you take me for? I'm <laughs> yeah. sitting here with my newly lied shape and yeah. all this that. No, um, but yeah, there it was. Sort of tucking into my breakfast, thinking England's doing really well in this semi final. You know, 20 nil up, 71 minutes gone. I'm thinking, yeah, it's all done and dusted. And then we had eight minutes of brilliance from Tonga, didn't we? Yeah, and, you know, I think sometimes sometimes you get games like that, don't you? I mean, rugby league's one of them sports where if someone, if you if you score once, you feel like you can score, you know, again and again, you know, because you get the ball back. And when you get a bit of a roll on it, see, you know, we've seen, you know, you look at Casford and, and domestically, you, you know, they're a team that can stack it up. You know, they can score two, three, four times. You know, in a row, um, you know, and uh, I mean, it was, it was, it was. I mean, obviously, Tonga is one of the stories of the World Cup. Obviously, Fiji as well, in terms of you know them being able to beat New Zealand. Those, those landmark results, really. Um, you know, and could you, you know, if Tonga had upset England, it would have been, you know, like I say, it would have been a massive upset. Uh, but you know, in some ways, that was good for England because it showed that you know it showed that they had to have that mental toughness and um, you know to be resolute mm. to prepare them for the final. It's just they've not. They just weren't able to to click it on the on the attacking on the attacking. Yeah, front. they weren't quite able to convert the chances, were they? I mean, in the first half, they should have been eighteen, probably twenty nil down, and it was really valiant defence, wasn't it? But in the second half, they saw far more of the ball. Probably had about eight or nine goals at the Australia line. Yeah, I mean, didn't really look like scoring in fairness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a couple of instances I think that you can remember. I think there was one where they shifted it out right, and, and Watkins sort of held the ball a bit too long, where you, you sort of felt if he'd have got it out to McGilvery, he'd have had a a better run at the line. Um, that was the main one I can remember in the, I think that was the first half and then the second half obviously had that, the ankle tap on, on, mm. on Watkins as well. I thought Brilliant I tackle thought, from Dugan. Yeah, I thought Watkins grew into the game really well. Um, you know, I thought he, he was a threat and I think, you know, the John Bateman thing, I mean, you know, it's not John Bateman's fault but I just feel that like England was so stunted attacking left because mm. it was getting to Bateman and then nothing was happening. It wasn't his fault, he's not centre but Ryan Hall just wasn't getting the ball. Um, and when you needed that little bit of creativity on that side, um, you just weren't getting it. Um, and I think it made things easier for Australia because they knew that if they if they stacked their left hand side defence yeah. to block off Watkins and McGilvery, that they could pretty much manage it on the right hand side with, with Bateman and Ryan Hall. Now a lot was made as well prior to the tournament about Kevin Brown getting the call up from Warrington after, to be honest, a bang average season. And I think I'm being a bit kind there. I think he's he's definitely played better in previous years when really he should have had a call up and didn't, rather than this year when he's played average and he's got that call up. And uh, for, for me, he didn't impose himself enough on that final. I, I was looking at the stats like I tend to do, and he only had 15 touches of the ball, and that yeah. was 12 passes and three carries. I think I commented on it actually on Twitter. He just he just didn't get involved in the game, no. and I don't know whether that was because you know Luke Gale was was scheme and things. I mean, I mean, for me, Kevin Brown's a left-hand side player. You know, he plays a lot on the left. You know, you'll have seen, you know, you've seen a lot of the tries that he would have set up at Widnes, for instance, all came down that left-hand side. Mm. And, um, but you know, you just never, you just never seen him there. You know, he was never over there. It almost seems like Luke Gale was the, the the main playmaker, and and it was Kevin Brown in the background. And and ultimately, he just didn't, like, say, he just didn't impose himself on the final. Now, whether that's a case of well, is the tactics, you know, to give Luke Gale that freedom and. And he's the number one, the number one caller. But you know, I feel like you, you sort of needed, you needed someone, you needed Brown to step up and, and try and create something mm. 
different, but then at the same time, was it difficult for him on with that left hand edge? You know, with with, with it being Bateman and and Ryan Hall, was it diff- would it have been difficult for Brown to have done what he what he typically would would be used to doing? You know, with not having a a standard centre out there. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I thought he tackled pretty well. I thought I thought he, he did well defensively. Um, but yeah, like you say, a bit of an odd one with Kevin Brown because you know there's no doubt that he's deserved international honours in his career. But Definitely, it's, yeah. it's, it's strange that probably the last two seasons have probably been his his weakest. It's probably been his poorest seasons in the last maybe seven or eight years, and that's when he's got his call up, which, which is a bit of a strange one. Um, I mean, for me, I'd have you know George Williams would be my six, you know, without question. Well, I think we um, we agree on that to be honest. Uh, Williams for me, I mean, top creative player in Super League this season. Yeah, and I think you know it's one of them now is whether in four years' time, obviously he'll be he'll be four years older and he'll probably have benefit from this. Same with Percival, maybe, you know, and that's the thing people were saying. Well, we needed a we need a half back, we need a creative half back, and we need a centre. And it's like, well, we had George Williams and Mark Percival, you know, out there. Does it also kind of surprise you as well the lack of game time Stefan Ratchford got and maybe? Maybe Scott Taylor as well to add to the Definitely the mix. Scott Taylor. You know, I, I, I failed to see what Hyington adds that Scott Taylor hasn't got. Um, you know, Stefan Ratchford's an interesting one because he's so, you know, the low, Johnny Lomax, you know, was was picked as the, the 17th man, if you like, um, as the extra sub. And, you know, I, I thought he had, a, I think he did all right when he came on, to be fair. Um, but for me, I would maybe have had Ratchford on that. And in that spot because you know he could come on and play at full back he can come and play at six he can play in the centres they could have mixed it up a little bit because yeah. it seemed in that final uh, the idea was to either get it to Gale or get it to Widdop and see what he can do yeah and I think I mean I saw I mean Gale was I mean I saw a lot of comments saying about Gale's kicking game but I didn't I didn't think he was up to that much to be honest I thought mm. there was a lot of there was a lot of booting it downfield and a lot there was of, quite a few as well where the ball went dead and it ended up with seven tackle sets which is really important at yeah, international yeah, level course, isn't it yeah and um, you know, I'm not saying that any of the others would have would have necessarily have made that much of a difference in there, but yeah, I think one of the problems that England have typically had is that we never know who the two halfbacks are, and we always seem to chop and change it, and it makes it difficult. Um, you know, whereas now you know you've got George Williams, you know, potentially George Williams could be the England standoff for ten years now. Mm. You know, so it's like, well, why don't we put a bit of faith in him now and say, right, we're going to play George Williams at six. You know, obviously try and figure out who the seven's going to be, whether it's going to be Gale, whether Matty Smith's going to come back, whether Sneed's going to get a run, you know, whether there's other players coming through that, you know, that might that might have a chance at it. And then just try and develop something, you know, because they're the key. You know, you look at Australia, I know obviously the triumvirate of, of Slater, Cooper Cronk and, uh, and Cameron Smith's a, a sort of once-in-a-lifetime type thing, but, you know, it certainly helps when your key players are, are steady and settled and, in the team for every every test match because you know they only they only get together four or five times a year, you know and they've got to switch on straight away. There's no like bedding in, you know. You've literally got to, you know, you've got to be bang, you got to be bang on your game straight away, um, you know. And so you you don't want to have to, you know. I think there's talk of a test against New Zealand in the in June next year. You don't want to have to have two half backs playing in that match and then a separate two half backs playing in the first test in, in the autumn. Yeah, you can see that happening, can't you, yeah, from an that, England and, point you know, of view? Yeah, and that's and you know, you look at you look at Ryan Hall and McGilvray are probably England's standout players at the moment, and that's because they've got the wing places nailed off. You know, they and they're in the system every time, aren't they? Now? Mm. You know, pretty much pretty much Hall, McGilvray and Watkins, to be fair, pick themselves, you know, in them three positions. And they're getting be- they get better and better from being in the system and and playing for the you know, over and over again. Um, you know, so that that's something they need to that we need to push towards. I think really. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to look a little bit more in detail at this World Cup with certain things that happened in it. Um, so, if I can just go through a couple of these stats now, crowds were around three hundred and seventy-two thousand for this tournament, which is a reduction of a good thirty, forty thousand on what was happening over here in two thousand and thirteen. Do you feel that the Australian crowds really bought into it? I've had a few. I've had. A f- I mean, I, obviously, I weren't fortunate to go over, but people I've spoken to who went over said it was quite poorly promoted. Right. Um, I think it's just you know the domestic game is so big in Australia, isn't it? Um, that you know they know pretty much Australia have got nothing to gain and everything to lose, haven't they? In the nationals because they're the favourites. Um, there was some disappointing cards, but that said, I think the crowds over here were sort of inflated by the double headers because I'm I'm pretty sure from memory that they counted the double header crowds twice. You know when the when the games were over here in Cardiff and at Wembley, 
I'm sure that's what happened. I might, I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's like how they That's a bit of creative accounting. Yeah, so that's far, how yeah. they inflate the figures a little bit, I think. Um, so it would have read 100,000 and it Wembley instead of the 52,000 yeah, that turned up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, it may, m- them figures might be different to the, to the, to the ones that I'm referencing. But, but yeah, a, bit, a little bit disappointing. I mean, you know, you want to get... I think I think the right thing is that Australia just don't host it now. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So obviously the next one's in England. The one after that's in America. Um, and that's going to be the big unknown, isn't it? Just how the American crowds will take to it. Yeah, and you know, and that's that's the thing. Um, you know, and in some ways, I know you know the the crowds as as daft as it sounds, the crowds in the ground actually aren't the biggest issue. You know, it's all about the getting the worldwide audience up, I suppose. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they're doing it in America. You know, I, I I've, I'd love to see one in France. I don't see why. I don't know why there isn't there hasn't been clamour to hold one in France. They've uh, kind of half hosted one, haven't they? Yeah, They've come that, in with you know, England it, a couple yeah, of times. The, thing, like, the last one over here it was like, well, it's in England, Wales, Ireland, and France, and you're just like, well, why don't you just have it in England, and then we can have a separate one that's in maybe France and Wales or something. Because I mean, to be to be fair as well, there was particularly one World Cup. It might have been the 2000 World Cup where they took it far and wide, and it hardly crossed rugby league territory. In fairness, yeah. but I remember that France, I think, had the best pool because they had like Papua New Guinea and Tonga in their pool. And wow, well, they would have been great games to yeah. sort of see, wouldn't they? You know, I, you know, I'm, you know, we're talking about developing the game and stuff. Then, you know, if France wanted it, why not? Why not have a whole tournament in France and you know try and try and use that as a springboard to develop the French domestic league. Mm. Um, or even Catalans with the season they've just had. Yeah, you know, that, you know, instead of having it, you know, obviously, which, instead of having it England one year, one tournament, Australia the next, which is what's happening at the moment, you know, obviously now we've broken away from that, obviously it's in England next time, then it's going to be in America. Presumably they'll have to take it back to Australia the year after that because they'll probably be clamouring for it. But it's like, you know, could the Pacific, Pacific nations host it between them sort of thing and, um, well, all the Pacific nations, they're really impressed in this tournament, didn't they? Other like, than Samoa. Samoa kind of got through to the quarterfinals in a know, strange format. Yeah, without knowing what the infrastructure's like, it's like, could you base a, a whole group in, say, Papua New Guinea, base a whole group, say, in Tonga? Well, they did. They had three home well, games in, in Papua New Guinea, didn't they? Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, if you do a tournament and say, right, we're well, keeping it away from Australia, we're going to host it in Tonga, Samoa, Fiji. And New Zealand. New Zealand, whatever. Uh, and, have, you know, base the whole you know, the host nation in the pool in that country um, and then have that for one of the tournaments maybe, I don't know. Um, ultimately, yeah, I mean, it's all about getting the fans in, you know, getting the TV views, getting the sponsorship and yeah, it, you know, some of the crowds did look disappointing and it, it did look a bit poor on TV. I don't um, want to just sort of like concentrate on the poor crowds because I mean, yeah, there was, I mean, you know, when England's hosting Lebanon in Sydney, which is supposedly... <laughs> rugby league mecca and there's only 10,000 yeah, in the gate that's disappointing isn't it yeah. but in saying that Papua New Guinea sold out all of the three pool games you, you also Tonga, the Tonga games were... you also had the the Tonga games which were really well uh, supported in Hamilton and then the semi-final in Mount Smart yeah, Stadium yeah. I don't think I have ever seen as much red and white yeah, in yeah, one yeah. place at once not even at least Sports Village Day not yet no no, no. maybe next season yeah um, the, yeah, I mean, yeah. So that's it. I mean, ultimately, it's all about the whole the whole purpose is to get more people watching, isn't it? So, um, yeah, it was disappointing to see some of the lower crowd. I mean, especially when you look at over here, England sold out. You know, they pretty much sold out. Pretty much all the England, you know, we had to sell out at Huddersfield for England mm-hmm. Island, and uh, twenty five thousand. I uh, think there was seventeen thousand at um, uh, at St Helens as well for Australia Fiji. Yeah, and you know, so yeah, just one of them things. But like I said, the international games low down on the Australia's priorities. So it's like, well. Just leave them to it and let someone else sort of take it on. Okay. Um, let's have a quick chat about the format because I've already mentioned it. It was the same format as the last tournament where nobody yeah. seemed to mind at that stage. But <coughs> when Ireland goes and wins two of their pool games, two out of their three games, really they're showing that they're probably better than a couple of the other nations that made it through to the quarters. Yeah, well, well I mean, obviously Ireland only lost one game and England lost two. So, if you think about it like that, um, yeah. It's, it's, I, Did we need like a Canada in there to sort I, of I just think get just have, another? Just have four pools of four and just have the top two from each. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, how difficult is it? But the reason why they have to do it the current way is because they're trying to manipulate it to get Australia, England, and New Zealand in the semi-finals. Hmm. That's all. That's because they know that's the, what sells, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. That's basically the only reason they're doing it. 
They want to have a big game at the start between Australia and England, which they couldn't have if they were in separate groups. <laughs> and then they want the semi-finals, and it's like, well, you know, what do you want? Do you want, you know, do you want the short-term gain and the long-term pain of losing your integrity, or do you want to do it properly? Um, and I've seen a few people say, oh, well, Portugal won the football Euro 2016 without winning a game in the groups or or whatever it was. And it's like, yeah, but at least it's fair for everyone. Mm. You know, anyone could have got through. Anyone could have got through that format. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, but as much as Portugal drew their three group games and then were winning in the extra time, any team could have done that. Whereas in this Rugby League World Cup, it was kind uh, of Jerry rigged from the start, wasn't yeah. it? That he was going to get. And, and yeah, okay, okay, you can say you know some more. Uh, might have had tougher opposition than Ireland or whatever, but that's not Ireland's fault. Ireland just beat what was in front of them. So, yeah, and I think they are changing it for the next one. I might be wrong. Someone might watch you might be able to correct us, but um, I think for the next one, they're going 16, oh, that's good. 16 teams. Whether they're still going to hack the format so they get this Australia-England game to start or, you know, the the semi-final or whatever, that, you know, because, you know, for me, you'd have Australia being pool one, England being pool two, New Zealand would be in pool three and say Tonga would be pool four, wouldn't they? As the yeah. that would be your sensible approach. Yeah, because that's you're rewarding the semi finalists, aren't you, for yeah. the last one? Um you know, and then obviously pot two, you know, the second teams in each might be Fiji, Lebanon, you know, the teams that are, you know, or, or depending on how the qualifiers go, if you like. And you know, for me I think I know, and people are saying, Oh well, then you'll get one sided games and I'm like, Well, if you look at this tournament, there was quite a few one-sided games anyway. There was really, In yeah. the group stage, there's only really one or two games that I can even remember. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I think we've just got to move away from being... I'd rather... You're better off having one-sided games than doing stuff that damages the integrity for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, look at Rugby Union World Cup. They keep it like that. And, you know, teams like Georgia and Romania, who 20, 30 years ago were getting, beat un, you know, were getting spanked by 100. Japan... One. Well, I remember '95 World Cup. I think uh, the New Zealand All Blacks played yeah, against beat Japan, Japan and b- beat them something like 140 yeah, or yeah. 17. Whereas didn't they? you look at you look yeah. at it now, they've been allowed over time. You know, yeah, okay, they've had these pastings, but you know, Japan beat South Africa last year. Georgia are now trying to get in the Six Nations, and it's like it's gonna be it's gonna take time. And the only way that the you know the only way that Fiji, a Fiji or a Tonga, as we've seen, are gonna improve, you know, are gonna be able to grow is by playing the bigger the bigger nations. And don't forget. You know, yeah, it's a pool of four. You've got, you know, let's just say pool one ends up being Australia, Fiji, Wales, and Canada. You know, them other three teams have all got a chance of beating each other to get into the quarterfinals, and that mm-hmm. would, you know, that would be progress. Okay, uh, moving on, talking about good tournaments and bad tournaments. I just want to just flash these by you. France, another really disappointing campaign for them. Yeah, um, I think I mean I've I've got a little bit of sympathy for France and Wales as I've mentioned before because I feel like they get a bit of a hard time because they're developing their own players. Hmm. Um, they're almost like a Georgia and a Romania in rugby union for me because they're developing their own players, whereas a lot of these other countries are just sort of piggybacking on having players of heritage and um, and stuff like that. But yeah, France should be doing. France should be doing better than they are. But I mean, I in saying that, they have got a couple of decent players. They've got Mark Carella, who's had a brilliant couple of years, the last couple of years with Toulouse. Uh, again, looks like a player that can step up, scored a 90-yard try yeah, against Australia, Australia, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Ilias Bergel as well, who's turned up on Lee's books this season. Man, you hasn't, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's had a strong World Cup regarding his carrying the balls, kit returns, etc. Well, I think... I mean, it's a difficult one for France. I mean, I think... Um, they're just one of them countries, aren't they, France? They had it in the football, like they they struggled in, you know, in a few tournaments. So it's a strange one with that because you know you look at you know the bulk of the players are coming from Catalan and Toulouse now, and and you're just like, well, you know, where where where's the push for growing it coming from? You know, can we get more of the domestic players involved, or do you know what I mean? It's a bit of a they should be doing better without without mm. doubt, really. Um, but yeah, I have a bit of sympathy for France and Wales. Uh, well. Wales was going to be my next one because ultimately I thought they were particularly poor for most of the tournaments in fairness. Yeah, they were decimated though, weren't they? I mean, they were. They've got a weak squad as it is and they obviously lost quite a few of their key their key players. And um, it didn't tell that they came up against Papua New Guinea on a particularly strong yeah, day, yeah, didn't yeah. they? And, you know, and that, that's it. You know, ultimately, you know, Wales is two semi-pro teams in the third tier over here. 
you know, and that's that's the best level that they're playing at. You know, obviously you've got the sprinkling of the Super League players like Lloyd White, who obviously was missing, um, Gil Dudson was missing as well, Bevan Flower, and th- there's only a little bit of a sprinkling of players, isn't there, that, that are eligible? You know, you haven't got a Yastin Harris or a Kieran Cunningham. You, you've not got that that sort of standard anymore. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, Wales just got a, they've just got what they have, haven't they? Basically. Um, so yeah, another disappointment for them, but at least they were in it this time. And talking about. Disappointing. Scotland were a big disappointment this time. They were bereft with um, issues off the field. They had three players sent home, didn't they? Yeah. It, it's like, again, it's a tough one with Scotland again because you know as well as much as they've done well in the previous two tournaments, you know as as it developed a great deal, you know as as rugby league developed a great deal in Scotland as a result, you know. And it's not, not really because they keep taking it to Cumbria, don't they? Yeah, not seeing much evidence of it, and then that that sort of then raises questions of well, what's the point? And you know, you know, what's the point in having a Scottish team full of Englishmen and Australians doing okay at a World Cup if it's not going to lead to, you know, something? You know, for for my money, by now, someone should have got a, a Championship One team, a League One team off the ground in Scotland if if there was the interest there, mm. uh, you know, and and instead they haven't. So uh, you know, I'm not. You know, obviously I like Steve McCormack and, and and stuff like that, but I'm not I'm not overly sad to see Scotland not doing particularly well. Um, There's almost a joke there, isn't there? There's an Englishman, Irishman, and a Scotsman yeah. off to a rugby league World Cup. Yeah, who, who did, did they, they play, play for? for? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> you know, I'd rather for me, I'd rather see Wales do better than Scotland because at least mm. Wales are sort of investing. They're still in trying it. to bring yeah, their own players Wales through, are aren't investing they? Investing in in it quite quite a lot and bringing their own players through and at least they're having a go do you know what I mean they're having a go and interesting with West Wales as well and all just touching on domestics that they are signing a lot of young Welsh talent that has played in the in the junior ranks aren't they yeah well I know there's um, there's a lot of there's because obviously you know rugby union's king in, in, in Wales and you know kids get picked up quite young and then they get cut at 16 17 18 and I know from speaking to a few people down there that they feel like there's a big opportunity for rugby league clubs to pick up these guys that have been released by pro rugby union clubs, for mm-hmm. instance, and then converting them. Um, and I feel like that's a model that they're exploring, um, you know, to see if there's some hidden gems that they can they can, they can can pull out of the bag there. Okay. Uh, moving on to other countries. Heroic Ireland. Yeah, I mean, to get that's the two wins. That's you know, all I put get, next to, to them. two wins, you know, is... thought they were brilliant against Italy. Yeah, yeah, and you know, obviously Italy Italy were one of the stories of the last World Cup of course. Um, you know, like America were. Um so yeah, it's just a shame that Ireland just sort of got brushed under the carpet a little bit because they went out. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, they never they never they were never able to bask in the glory like say Fiji were or Tonga were. You mentioned America who were so good at the last World Cup. They f- they were a bit out of the depth this time, weren't they? Perhaps they didn't have as many players that they could call upon from yeah, Australia. Well, well, they had um was it the part the Paolos played for Samoa did they? Is that right? The who played yes. for America yeah. last time and Tonga actually. I think I think, I think, I think that's one of the pro- I think that's one of the problems that the countries that rely on the heritage players have is that because they chop and change, it's like, you know, like Italy from the last World Cup, Italy were pretty much unrecognisable and America pretty much unrecognisable. And it's like, you know, are you really getting any continuity there? At least, mm. you know, as much as we've just, criti- I've just criticised Scotland, at least you have that continuity of the same players putting their hand up every, every, every year, whether it be the Four Nations, whether it be the European Cup, whereas you don't seem to get that with, with some of the other countries. So it'd be interesting to see how, America develops for the 2025 World Cup, which is obviously where, you know, the host, obviously, you know, fingers crossed Toronto Wolfpack and A and other American teams are, are going by then. So, you know, you never know who's going to have lived over there for long enough to qualify or... Oh, yeah, because I wonder whether they've got a three-year residency rule like... Well, it's uh, difficult we they don't live there, though, do they, Dave? I think they that's don't. The, that's part... I, 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 certainly the Toronto ones do, but I don't know if the New York are thinking of doing it slightly different because obviously it's not as far to fly. Uh, well, I don't know, actually. That, I might be completely so, I don't know. Don't, don't go asking me. You can get to New York in seven hours, can't you? Because it's very west, mm. very east, I mean. Very east America. Where I ain't got a clue where Toronto is on the map, really. Uh, north of New York. Yeah, well, I know it's north. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know whether... We should, we should have got your, we should have got your <laughs> yeah, stadium got the, hoppers the, the stadium behind hopper us. We could, have, we could have done a little presentation, you know. But yeah, I don't, I don't know on that, but maybe that's something that they might look at. Mm. Uh, you know, so it'd be interesting to see what happens there anyway. Now, I wanted to sort of also talk about New Zealand. I just put brilliantly unpredictable. They, they played some fantastic rugby New Zealand, scored, you know, obliterated Scotland, for example. 
uh, and yet they lost both those games against Fiji and against Tonga. Tonga. And the Tonga game was probably the game of the tournament for me. Yeah, and you know, I, I think before the tournament, everyone had identified that Tonga were a threat, and that was the game where it came together for them, wasn't it? Uh, you know, New Zealand have obviously lost a couple of players, you know, because they've gone on up and played for Tonga or, or for other other countries, and um, there. So I, I guess if you were to look, if you were to look at things on paper, you know, they've got one professional team in the NRL. You'd like to think that England could be stronger than New Zealand. So you'd like to think if you were a tier two nation, that New Zealand were the one that you were looking to pick on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's you know that's how it proved. You know, for Fiji to win four two. That was an unbelievable game as yeah, well, wasn't you know it? I mean, uh, you know, that's 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 a great little story. That um, so you know, it'll be interesting to see where where New Zealand go from from here. Really, um, you know, they 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 perhaps in the past have relied on the the players from Samoa and Tonga putting their hand up and playing for New Zealand. Whereas now, those players might go and play for Samoa and Tonga instead, mm-hmm. um, which 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 is going to maybe lessen New Zealand's level. Um, it'd be interesting to see how they stand up next season and against England in the in the in the Test series, um, just to see whether they can. Manage. You know, don't forget, twelve months ago they drew with Scotland, New Zealand. So there wasn't the warning signs were there, you know, for these sorts of you know not taking anything away from Scotland or indeed Fiji or Tonga, but the warning signs were there twelve months ago that New Zealand were there to be picked off. And they have been this World Cup, you know, haven't they? Yeah, so. you know that's what's happened. Um, also, as well, did you make of Lebanon? They they brought a lot to the tournament by way of culture, didn't they? I was yeah, just thinking about how one. how uh, lively the the games seemed to be with the crowd involvement. They sort of came from nowhere, didn't they? Because they don't, they obviously weren't in the last World Cup. I I remember um, I remember them beating Wales in a world. They knocked Wales out of the World Cup qualifiers for the two thousand and eight tournament at Widnes. It, it was at Widnes. They, I think they beat Wales fifty two thirty or something like that, and that was a, a shock result really at the time, and that. I think they ended up getting beat by Samoa in the final qualifier, so I don't think mm-hmm. they made it. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, the, the whole point of the World Cup is that you see these different different nations, and you know, hopefully that gives them the springboard. Like I said, the whole the whole point of it is to hopefully give them the springboard to then kick on and do something to progress rugby league or progress the national team, and hopefully we'll see that happen. We've already mentioned Papua New Guinea. I mean, I thought that they added so much to this tournament in the way that. They play a brutal version of rugby league, yeah, which yeah. I feel is dead, dead entertaining because you don't know quite where their attack's going to come from. It's not conventional, is it? Yeah, yeah. And when they hit, blimey, did yeah. they hit. I mean, I mean, you know, the, we need to make more of Papua New Guinea. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's the national sport. You know, it's the only country in the world I think that rugby league's a national sport. And, uh, and you know, obviously, witness have signed um, Kato Atio, who's one of the centres for Papua New Guinea. At the world. He had a really but, good tournament, too. Um but what struck me is that you should see the amount of people commenting on things relating to witness now, you know, from Papua New Guinea. It's quite quite interesting. And, you know, it's like, you know, you look at football and other sports who go to Asia to get that, you know, the, the fanatical, you know, support from Asia, you know. I don't think witness like, needs any more fanatical well, uh, supporters. <laughs> that's, um, well, but, but, you know, why shouldn't rugby league go after that? So, you know, you want to get the Papua, and then obviously they've got the, the Queensland Cup team, haven't they? That, um, who won the competition the NRL, last won time, didn't they? Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, so it was it. There might be the New South Wales Cup. We better co- I'm better, better cover my base there. In case no, no, no. You were right. It was right. the Queensland right. Cup. Um, he was right. You know, why, why shouldn't we take advantage of their passion and hope that that rubs off on rubs off on others? It's yeah. Fiji that are wanting to introduce a team to the New South Wales right, Cup. Actually. Right. Oh, so yeah. That's where, Sorry, that's uh, where uh, Petro Sivina Sivas behind that one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, again, uh, just sort of like looking at uh, unsung heroes of this World Cup. Okay. All right. So I've got Danny Addy from Scotland because he was asked to play numerous roles. I think he, in the three games he played three different positions, which just sums him up because he yeah. is that type of guy, isn't he? Oliver Roberts and Kyle Amor from Ireland. I thought, particularly considering Kyle Amor had had a, a relatively poor end to the season at St. Helens where he wasn't getting picked, he wasn't getting in the team. Uh, and then Oliver Roberts comes from nowhere, from Huddersfield, yeah. scores a couple of tries and he's suddenly on everybody's lips. Yeah, I mean, one note about Amor is he's already back in pre-season at St. Helens. He put his hand up and, and came straight back and got straight into pre-season. I think that, that um, says something shows, about his character, yeah, yeah, doesn't it? Uh, you know, he's got a point to prove. I, I you know I like Carl Amor, you know, and he's you know he's played for England. That's probably spurred him on a little bit that he's missed out on 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 the tier one selection and put his hand up. I mean, another one for me, actually, that I was, I was going to mention this earlier, Chris Hill. 
All right, yeah. Um, you know, being honest, I'd sort of written Chris Hill off before the tournament, you know, a pretty poor season at Warrington. He sort of seemed to have been, you know, he's, he's going that way instead of that way. But I thought he really put his hand up and, and got through a load of work, especially in the final. Um, you know, made me think, you know, actually I was, you know, I made the wrong call. Um, I was just going to run through a couple of these other names as well. Gary Lowe from Papua New Guinea. We've got a new cult hero, haven't we? Castleford fans can't wait to see him in action next year. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, you know, after after what's happened at Castleford this year, you know, imagine adding more excitement into that. I've also got Josh Hodgson on this list as an unsung hero because I suppose... He picked up that bad injury, didn't he? You know, which is probably going to ruin his next season. Is that why you've given him an unsung hero? Yeah, well, I actually thought he was fair decent as well. Right, right. I'll just, that's a sympathy vote, isn't it, Dave? I think, I think, yeah, I mean, it is a shame for him. You know, he don't like to see it, especially because he's been ripping it up, hasn't he? And, you know, it's always good to have English players ripping it up in the NRL. And, you know, for him to then miss out on a full season is, is going to be pretty pretty tough on him. From a, you know, from a purely selfish English point of view, I mean... If you were to choose one one position where we'd have an injury, you'd, you'd choose Hooker, wouldn't you? Because we've got quite a production line. Uh, well, there is. There's at least five or six players that you could mention that could all do a good job yeah, at international level, isn't there? You know, so. Step up. Um, the two Boas brothers for Papua New Guinea, the two halfbacks, right, yeah. I love watching them. They right. were brilliant. And I think that, you know, the World Cup just went along with them in a way, didn't it? Uh Ilias Berg, I'll get some mention here because I thought he was again very good for for France. Uh, and Elliot Whitehead, bit of an unsung hero for England, I think. Yeah, I suppose he, you know, obviously another player who's in the NRL. He's not, you know, he's not a fashionable name if you like, like a bird you saw a James Graham. But you know, you know, obviously he's he's performing at a high standard every week in the NRL. So um, I think it was fifty five or fifty six tackles he came up with in the final. So yeah, he was working you know, his socks he gets off. Busy. Um, you know, the, the, I suppose the the ongoing discussion now is does it, does England need a half back in Australia? Um, but then it's interesting because obviously Widdop, he is that half back. He was the best standoff in the NRL this year, and we played him at fullback. <laughs> and obviously, we ended up playing him at fullback. So you're like, well, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, well, does it matter? The last of me unsung heroes, and this could cause a little bit of controversy. I'm going John Bateman because he was asked to do that job. Yeah, and that's the. I mean, that. Yeah, and you're right, you're right. you know, I just think that. <coughs> okay, yes, they did take Percival out there, and for me, Percival should have got in. But when John Bateman is being asked to do a job that he doesn't do on a regular basis, and he did a solid job, he kept uh, his opposing centres quiet. I mean, obviously, he maybe didn't offer as much with the ball like you were saying about earlier. No, and that's it. I mean, you can't you can't criticise Bateman for it. It's not his fault if he's picked to play centre. He, you know, he's going to. He's going to play and do his best, and that's what he did. Uh, and that's the thing; it's not, you know, we, it shouldn't be seen as a criticism of John Bateman necessarily. It's not his fault he was played out of position. Um, so, so yeah, no, that's a fair shout. Uh, as well, sort of looking on it, I've got some disappointments of the World Cup. So this is just a, a couple of notes that I made that we didn't see enough of Percival. Mike McMeekin. I forgot that he went over there, to be honest. Yeah. We never saw anything of him other than about 10 minutes of the first game or something like that. A nice holiday for him, though. <laughs> um, and Specifically when all, they've had like really good domestic seasons as well, that's disappointing that they didn't get that recognition at the end of it. Yeah... It, it's a tricky one, I think, now with the internationals because obviously they only they only play the, the three or four games at the end of the year, don't they? And, and I mean, this almost like the Kevin Brown scenario again is is Wayne Bennett knows these players, you know, he knows certain players from having worked with them before. Whereas, you know, you then, you know, for a Mike at me, you know, for someone who's had a good year this year to then go in, they've basically got one friendly to impress. And get the trust of the coach, haven't they? You know, and, and get you know. Whereas the coach has got to think, well, what's his systems? What does he want to play? And um, it makes it difficult um, for players like that. You know, however good you've been, you know, what for your club to then just come in as a as an un, not as an unknown as a player, but as an unknown in the sit in the setup. Okay. So then, you know, for then the coach to put his faith in you, it's tricky. Magic moments, that's the next topic of discussion. Right. Uh, so, what were your... Magic give us a moments. couple of magic moments from the World Cup. Um, obviously, the, Fiji, the, Fiji, the one for me is the Fiji one, the Fiji 4-2. The last, like, 10 minutes of that where, 
you'd sort of got through the full game thinking, oh, you know, you've had it loads of times, haven't you, where, you know, you watch a game and, you know, maybe the underdog's winning and then you get to that 10 minutes and then the minute minutes are ticking by and then the more and more it goes, you're thinking, they're going to do this. And for then, when the hoot went and, you know, obviously the relief and the celebration and the significance of it, for me, that was the, that was the, that was probably the moment I remember most. Okay, here's a, a few of mine. See, you can tell I've had a bit of time to prepare this, can't you? Uh, Valentine Holmes getting five tries in the quarterfinal against Samoa and then topping that with six tries yeah. against Fiji. I mean, that's an unbelievable couple of games there for that fella, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, there's, nothing, there's not really much more you can say to that 11 tries in two games. It's got to be some sort of record, hasn't it? Particularly at international level, having said that. Um Tonga's superb performance to come back from 16-2 against New Zealand and win. Uh, the pool stages in Port Moresby. I thought it was great to see three capacity crowds there. Yeah, and that, like what we were saying before, you know, maybe that's something that they can look at for the future and, you know, as an idea, you know, can we have a pool based in, you know, in a, in a one stadium almost? And, you know, I think that might be a, a pretty cool idea. Okay. Not that many of my ideas get taken up, but I can, I can bang the drum about it. Well, yeah, I mean, it certainly gets people talking, isn't yeah. it? So that's that's the idea behind it anyway. Um, I was thinking tries of the tournament as well, and there was one in particular that really caught my eye, and it came between Fiji and Wales. And I think it was where uh, Uati beat about six players when he set off and then handed on to Matoya, and Matoya beat two players to go in at the corner, and I thought it was just a wonderful piece of play over about 70 metres. I like the Corral. I, I just like the the Corral one for France, um, just because it was against Australia and because I like a ninety meter burst to the dash. line. Yeah, they like the dash. The uh, and then as well, Lebanon picking up the first World Cup win. Yeah, against uh, oh the first in in the knockout or oh, sort of in the proper World Cup yeah, rather World than Cup, the right, qualifiers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there you go. Um, moving on, I was thinking team of the tournament. Right. Okay. So I've picked the full seventeen here. So I just want to see where your okay, where your on. thoughts lie in comparison to mine. So I've gone uh, full back Billy Slater. Is this just going to be the Australia team? No, no, no. It's oh, not. Okay. There is a there is a mixture. There is a mixture. It's, it just sounds a bit like the Australian team to refer <laughs> initially. Uh, you've got Valentine Holmes on one wing, and Jermaine McGilvery on the other. At centre, I've gone with Nenny McDonald from Papua New Guinea. Thought he had a really strong tournament. And Akula Uati from Fiji. Uh, halfbacks, Michael Morgan and Cooper Cronk of Australia. In the front row, I've gone with Co uh, Tekieo from uh, Tonga. Bless you. <laughs> I've tried to practice that. You wouldn't believe how many times I've had to try and practice that before saying it. I've gone with Cameron Smith and I've gone with James Graham. I thought Jammer really stood up in this tournament. Best prop in the world. Yeah, I mean you can't you can't knock him really. Um, you know he puts a shift in every week, doesn't he? And he's a top quality player. In the back row, I've gone with Viliame Kikau from Fiji. I've gone with Reese Martin from Papua New Guinea, and Jason Tomalolu from Tonga. Yeah, I mean you would have watched more games than me, Dave. So about to your superior knowledge. Oh, I don't know. I thought you was up at Cracker Sparrow Fat for most oh, of these no. games in Furnace. A bit early for me, some of them. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it would just be good. going up at four o'clock in the morning for Papua New Guinea. Yeah, it was good. It was good for it was good. It's good to have a spread, isn't it? It's good to have um, multiple teams and multiple players to talk about yeah. rather than it just being the same old. I mean, Tom Lawley for me is the best bat rower currently in the game. Yeah, and, he, and you know he's he's probably the he's probably the highest profile, isn't he? Of these guys that have said right, see you in New Zealand. You know, I'm going to do this, and that actually might. You know, we might look back on this tournament as being that sort of landmark breakthrough tournament for them. You know, that that sort of thing. You know, you're looking at now. I guess the big, the big. I think it's the big, the big issue is state of origin, isn't it? I think mm-hmm. the, the the thing that's maybe going to hold it back is whether they relax the the uh, eligibility on state of origin. You know, so if you play for Tonga, you can't play. Whether if you're a Queenslander or whatever, you can't play in state of origin because obviously that's something that that players are attracted to. Okay, uh, I've also gone for a bench here. Oh right, bench as well. Yeah, yeah, Mitchell Moses from Lebanon. Right. Standoff. Right. Oh yeah. 
See, I've gone a, a little bit against the grain here because normally to be honest, you, I, you carry I'm a hooker. Surprised you had Morgan in the in the starting team because I don't think really. He's, yeah, I think I like him. I think that he's he's really controlling. And when you look at his maybe, performances maybe at the is. big, maybe you know, I mean, the thing is, he's obviously you're expecting all these exciting plays all the time from Australia, aren't you? And he, you know, maybe they do need that level head from time to time. Just for me, I just I just think I thought he's a steady Eddie. You know what I mean? He's nothing. But that's I think that's quite why I liked him, right, though, right, you know, because enough, he does. And you looked at it, and he was never that far away from the ball against yeah, England. Whatever, yeah. yeah, and I guess you need someone who's going to, you know, you need someone to rely upon, don't you, who, you know, who's not going to lose his head at a key time. I've gone for Louis McCarthy Scarsbrook from Ireland. I thought he was brilliant, actually, playing out in the second row. Yeah. He had a, seemed like he had he a started, new lease he, of he, life. He, sorry, he ended the season pretty strong, didn't he, with mm. St. Helens and, and seemed to carry that on. And, uh, yeah, he did. Uh, certainly in the, in the bits where I watched Ireland, he seemed to be getting through a ton of work. I've gone for Alex Twal from Lebanon. Maybe one of the lesser known names, but if you look at his actual work rate and sort of meters made in the tournament, involvement in tackles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he's right up there with the top forwards. Uh, and then completing the lineup, Luke Page from Papua New Guinea. He was the uh, the big Queensland prop. You're going to be setting up the uh, the Lee branch of the Papua New Guinea Sports Club. Oh, I'm a big fan. Yeah. I'm a massive fan of Papua New Guinea. Always have been, but I, I, honestly, I do think that I do think one of the English teams could really make a. You know, if they, I mean, I know Hull Car sort of had that little bit of a a link with them, didn't they? You they know, did. They had a couple of players, didn't they? Know, Stanley Jean, obviously, the Stanley. Yeah, and obviously that's Papua New Guinea played there, didn't they? And, and Michaele Azu as well know, had a long yeah, spell there. They had the World Cup game there in in 2013. But honestly, I think you know, if you were a bit, if you were a commercial manager at Super League Club, you'd think well. Could we not pick up two or three of these Papua New Guineans? Make our away kit look like a Papua New Guinea, you know, the yellow with the red and white and black. You know, because away kit's an away kit, isn't it? No one play it. No one cares what you're playing away. You know, and then sell a few jerseys, you know. You know, they do it in football for commercial reasons. So, you know, why couldn't someone look at it? You know, I mean, I know, I know, I know, that, I know that Papua New Guinea isn't the wealthiest country in the world, but, you know, far from it. Um, but I just think, you know, imagine, imagine if you were a club who could get that little bit of profile. Mm. I think the the impressive thing, though, from this latest Papua New Guinea side, if you like, is that a lot of them are linked with some big clubs. There's yeah. fellas who have been at like Canberra and Brisbane and people like that, isn't there? Yeah, and obviously they've got this stepping. They've obviously got the stepping stone now. Obviously, with, you know where people are getting. The, you know, they're, they're putting themselves on the shot window, aren't they? Pretty much every week because other teams are seeing them. You know, there'll be there'll be NRL clubs at pretty much all their games to see them. Um, it's not like Jesse Joe Parker who, back in 2008 for example when he was playing I think he was a, a farm hand right you know so he he, he just played rugby league part time yeah, for and then I don't know Port Moresby Vipers or someone yeah, like yeah, that yeah. and then got picked up and, and that, played over know, here and that's it but, but genuinely I, there's got to be an opportunity for, for a club I think to pick up two or three Papua New Guineans make a big deal out of it you know become almost like the, the favourite English team of the Papua New Guineans and you know, roll with it. Maybe this is what we're disarming at. Well, I'd like to have your confidence, Dave, but... Uh... I'm confident, I'm confident. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, right, any last thoughts about this World Cup before we go? No, I mean, I think, you know, it would have been nice to have a higher profile, wouldn't it? It would have been nice for it to be bigger, but I think we've just got to just roll with it, you know, we've just got to, just got to keep... I think everyone gets so paranoid about the perceived lack of coverage, but actually, it does get covered. You know, it, you know, there's plenty of stuff in the in the national press, and all there was a big there was a big fuss the week before the tournament, wasn't there? But there was there's loads of coverage. The rugby league's actually getting loads of coverage in the Mirror, the Daily Star, the Sun, the Guardian. You know, it's getting coverage. That's not the issue. You know, for me, rugby. You know, the issue for rugby league isn't that it's getting the press coverage. It's, it just needs to get on with it. It just needs people just need to get behind it and and, and push it. Um, you know, and I, and I think oh, that's the thing. There's no conspiracy. You know, rugby league. If anything, rugby league punches well above its weight in terms of the the coverage and and stuff that it gets when you look at the size of it overall. And you know, things like the World Cup are designed to to grow it. And that's why you know that's why I think you know don't worry about games being one sided. If they are one sided, they are one sided. I'd expect Australia. You know, if Australia aren't battering Lebanon, then I'd be worried. Do you know what I mean? Just as you would in football, if England couldn't batter San Marino, you'd be worried. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's just the fact you've not that just I've... you've not just sort of come up with that one. They're not playing San Marino anytime soon. No, no, I'm not. I'm not on commission or anything like oh, that. Oh, thank goodness for that. But um, but I thought we were going to put that to the I test think, then think for a minute. I think for me, the biggest thing rugby league needs to do is just believe in itself for what it is. 
you know, stop trying to pretend to be something it's not, and you know, just just go with the flow. You know, um, it, it does my head in sometimes where you know, it, you know, almost like people are ashamed because the rugby league's background and where it started. But that's that's what made up the that was what makes up the story of the game. Um, you know, and we've just put on a World Cup with fourteen different countries. Which is a fair achievement, really, and you know, and all people, will cri- you know, myself included, will criticise where the players have have come from. You know, you know how many Scottish players was there realistically, and but the fact is that it's growing, and they've been um, proud to pull on the jerseys of whichever country they represented, yeah, I mean, haven't they? This year, certainly, the Pacific Nations, is the Pacific Islanders, have certainly stepped up, and you'd like to think that maybe in four years' time, if Wales and France can can sort of get their acts together a little bit, uh, sort of get their acts together a little bit. Um, you know, it'd be really interesting to see what happens if, say, Canada, you know, depending on what happens with Wolfpack and whether they bring any of their own players through, it'd be really interesting to see where that project's got to in four years and whether, you know, in, in four years' time we're looking at a World Cup where you've got even two or three Canadian players playing in a Canada team would be, a, you know, with a view to obviously that they're becoming six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the following World Cup. You know, that'd be a step forward, but you just got to roll with it, you know, just roll with it instead of just being paranoid and. You know, trying to be, pretend to be something we're not. Just, just roll with it. I think we should finish on an Oasis record. To be fair, yeah. Uh, James, as always, an absolute pleasure. Cheers, Dave. Good to be back. And uh, remember that you can like, share, comment, get this video as far and wide, and we just want to hear your comments. To be yeah, fair, yeah. We'll, we'll reply to some of the comments in the. Uh, we'll reply to some of the comments in the comment box below. <laughs>